And Imran, Imran, how you doing? I'm good, man. How's it going? Long good. time. We were talking see. about yeah, uh, from our Monday morning call yesterday. Hopefully, everyone can start catching those on a on a weekly basis. And we were just talking about how uh, IWM was showing up on our volatility scanners, possibly some lows there, and uh, it's a five percent today. So um, mm. just unbelievable moves uh, across the board here in markets. And we have a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, and so I will just start firing away here. Uh, if you do have any questions, please pop them in the chat. PDJ, I agree with you. What a day. Uh, Dave Evans mentions the dollar moving down. Uh, Imran, in particular, can talk about that. He's the macro man uh, on the call here. Um, so first, S&P, uh, just, you know, an incredible move into this 4,500 area today. Um, my view, and I'd uh, like to get your view on this here, Imran, is that um, mm -hmm. our call wall was 4,450 yesterday. There's a lot of open interest at 4,500 uh, that presents a big gamma bar there. So you can see that um, on this chart here, there's your 4,400, there's 4,500. If we start to push up towards 4,600, the gamma really starts to dwindle. And so what I was... My setup was that, and I still think this is the case, uh, we've got an augmented a little bit, is that VIX was going to mark, mark a market high. And, and just to sort of back this up, the, the VIX expiration was tomorrow. If you look at our founder's note here, we, we dedicate this. Uh, you know, this, this suggests that tomorrow morning is, is going to be a short-term high. I thought we'd consolidate into the 4300s and we would have a year-end rally into the 4450 to 4500 area. And that's because if you look at where the big open interest is, Year end, you know, the last kind of strike, a lot of open interest is 4450. You got the you know, JP Morgan collar call that everyone likes to talk about is in the 4500s uh, area there. And so, you know, that was my setup. A little bit of weakness here, triggered by VIX. I still think that happens, uh, but I thought we'd tag in the 4300s and then give a final year and rally. Well, we're at 44, we're at 4500 now unexpectedly. I still think we're going to sell off tomorrow after VIX expiration. Uh, but we're just 1% from what I thought was going to be a, a material market high. Um, but my opening question sort of to you, I guess, is, is you know, what are you looking at in the markets now that we've pulled, have we pulled forward returns? Is this just, you know, a new base for us to launch the year in rally? Kind of what do you, did, did today so, change your mind? So I, I would say that until this move that we just had, it looked like options markets were having quite a lot of influence, right? In mm -hmm. terms of holding the market, not really letting it get too far away from 4,400. And we, we, you know, we knew the market was trading long gamma um, from the price action in implied vol all of last week. And we know that where, where the big open interests are. So, so it, you could tell the street owned it, but with that CPI number coming coming worse than expected or coming lower than expected, not worse, that's kind of a good thing. Um, the reaction that we've seen just shows you that actually it's not, the options can't hold it. So there's, there's quite a lot of buying flow that was coming anyway in November. It was like corporate buybacks were restarting, CTAs were covering, going from short to long, and you've got general mutual fund inflows that happened in November. All of these things were supportive to the market anyway. And the idea was, okay, fine, they're, they're ongoing buyers. And if the market goes up, there'll be sellers in the form of the, the dealers that are hedging their gamma. But I think that's just got blown through. So I, I just think that the gamma wasn't big enough to hold these buying flows. And then you also had an incremental buying flow that came from the fact that the inflation data has now priced rate cuts sooner than expected. So you had a massive move in SOFA futures, like 20 bips across the curve from sort of late, late part of late part of next year onwards. And the, the dollars got battered on the back of it as well. So is you know, all these factors, these macro factors seem to be overriding the fact that the options market is long. So I don't up here, I still think the option market is probably long, right? But yeah. it's just if you're long gamma, you've actually done quite well today, right? Yeah. And, and, and so maybe the way to frame this is that, you know, you, you have an equilibrium in equities that's based on, you know, let's just call it rates. And, and so when rates drop, the equilibrium for equities, I guess, should shift higher, right? Is, is maybe a kind of a more naive way to look at that. Um, but, you know, the the performance of a lot of these stocks in the year, and I want to show this, uh, we did an OPEX effect podcast yesterday, and there's a lot of interesting slides that I wanted to use here. But 
This was from one of our new new tools. This is a, a, a fixed strike vol matrix. And what I thought was interesting, this is from yesterday. This is pre-CPI. Uh, this is the change in, in implied vols. Here you have Microsoft, Google, Amazon. What you can see are these shades of green. So the, the dark gray or the light gray, excuse me, was the at the money from yesterday. So, so now we're uh, quite changed a bit. But th these areas of green tell me that, you know, even though the markets had rallied so much over the start of November, that these upside strikes were getting bid, right? That 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 call implied vol was up in in the face of these rallies, which which to your point sort of suggests that you know there is this long gamma trade that if we rally because of CPI, that stocks got to get bought uh, as we continue to rally, and, and traders were positioned for this kind of year end rally, and and they're just served you know like a a double Sunday with whipped cream on top with this <laughs> CPI uh, trade that just sort of feeds into this. Um, and, and really pulls things forward and, and stretches them, you know, quite a bit. Um, so, you know, uh, it, it's hard to disagree with with uh, with what your views are there. Um, I wanted to. So, so we, we have now this big market rally, and I, I think everybody and their brother is now favoring, you know, Santa Claus rally at this point. And, um, you know, again, I had mentioned that my upside zone was 4,500 to 4,550. You know, we're, we're certainly, you have to argue, at, at risk, obviously, of, of going through that level based on today's move. But the, the chart that I put together this morning that I thought was rather interesting, um, and, and I'd love to get your view of these dynamics, the black lines here are VIX expirations. And so mm -hmm. with the exception of May, at, at every single VIX expiration after the, the market at some point has gone lower. This is the S&P, right? And, and it's not always that it goes, look, 10% lower, but there's this moment of consolidation. Sometimes that consolidation has been a little more meaningful, as you can see. But every single VIX expiration of the last, let's just call it six in a row, I believe it is, uh, we've seen equity market retracement. And I think that's a, a real setup here now because we have not only the VIX expiration, the VIX has gone from 20 to 10, uh, excuse me, 20 to 14 over you know, this this time period here, we now have single stock call values are really, really large. They're really, really stretched. Uh, and that's going to hit with November OPEX on Friday. And so I think the market is ripe for some consolidation here. Um, what What's your view on on sort of a VIX inspired or volatility or OPEX inspired, you know, retracement here? Do you think that's on the table? Um, and if you want to give some of your views on, on why VIX expiration can lead to uh, some equity market shifts in the equity market. Uh, I'd love your opinion on on both of those factors. Yeah. So, so historically, I agree that you have seen a bit of a rally in the market and a sell off in in VIX into expiration, and and that has often marked a low vol. Now, I would say a lot of those expiries that you've drawn on the chart in into those VIX expirations, there was a lot of call open interest that was expiring, right? Because there was a lot of call demand on VIX. That was the way people were hedging. They weren't really hedging using S&P downside. They were hedging using upside on the VIX. And, and, that, and the kind of decay of those calls was leading to a compression of VIX into expiry. And then once that had kind of gone, you had like new buying of VIX and stuff. And, and a bid to VIX translates into a sell of S&P. So then you got weakness on the S&P. And then also you had macro reasons for the weakness, the weakness being ignored into expiry. And then you had a catch up. In, in the S and P once the once the opex had gone away, so now this time round I mean, is a weird one because I was thinking I was thinking we were going to kind of pause, not really manage to rally so much this week because of the gamma, and then once that was gone, the year end rally would kick into gear. Now as that was completely wrong, so what's turned out is the rallies kicked in early because the data has given it an excuse to. And you've just got all the buying flow that's overwhelmed the gamma and the gamma hasn't been able to hold it. Now, I agree things are a bit overbought. I mean, you look at NVIDIA, apparently like the, the five day RSI on NVIDIA is at like some stupid level, like in the 90s. Right? I don't look at five day RSIs, but I just noticed that someone put that on Twitter. But it's like, you know, some of these names are crazy overbought, but NVIDIA earnings is next week. Right. So I don't know how the market reacts to that. Um but I, I, I ultimately, I think any dip in the market is going to get bought with two hands. So, I, I, you know, if you get a dip to 4,400 again between now and middle of next week, I, I think it is going to get bought. So, so it's kind of like a moot point, whether we correct or not. I just yeah. think, I think we're ending the year higher. 
I think we're probably ending the year above 4,600. I think the VIX is probably on a 12 handle by then, right? And it's just a question of how and when you want to get yourself into that position, right? Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and I think that one of the things I almost wrote in our note this morning is that, you know, you try to get too cute with this thing where if you believe that markets are set to rally, then then you just say, OK, this is a year in position. And if we do get some OPEX consolidation, you know, just be prepared to you know, buy more into that dip or just sort of adjust on that rather than try to waiting for some dip that may come. And so, you know, I think it could be, you know, sort of with hindsight, you know, feel a bit uh, guilty about, you know, saying, look, <laughs> just position for it. And uh, and if it happens, great. And if not, you know, if we consolidate a little bit um, next week, then you'll be happy or maybe buy some more. But uh, mm -hmm. one of the things I want to mark in NVIDIA, and I think we talked about this briefly yesterday, is this is the 500 strike in NVIDIA. I mean, this is absurd how big this gamma bar is, as you can see. Uh, I've never, I can't say that I've seen something like this in terms of the positioning, you know, how big this is <laughs> in NVIDIA. Uh, and they do report, I think, next week. Um, mm -hmm. If not, yeah. I think maybe the week after. I think it's next Tuesday. Yeah. In a week's time. Yeah. I'll have to expand this a little bit. I think it's the 27th. Um, I thought it was 21st. There it is. So they, they do it on Thanksgiving when everyone's gone. Um, and the 7% apply. That's, that's the 21st, right? Yeah, 21st. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. They do it the week of Thanksgiving when our, our Thanksgiving. I don't, you guys don't have Thanksgiving over there, do you? Well, no, but we kind you of. got nothing to be thankful for. It goes, it goes yeah. quiet. It goes quiet. <laughs> Uh, and, and so, you know, look, um, there's something, it, it, there's something unique about that, uh, that 500 strike in, in, uh, in NVIDIA. So, um, take that for what it's worth. So someone's asking a question that I think's worth answering now, right? Cause we'll forget later. And yeah. someone's saying, how does the decay of VIX options affect the price of S and P options? Yeah. Okay. So let me just quickly explain that. Right. So yeah. anytime. Anytime the VIX is traded, the VIX futures, the way that that is hedged is, is often using S&P because the VIX has a direct, the way the VIX moves and the way the VIX is priced is directly related to S&P and S&P options, right? So a purchase of the VIX is kind of like, think of it as a buy of VIX futures is similar to just buying S&P puts which is a short position on the S&P and is a buy of volatility, a buy of Vega, okay? That's how these things get hedged, right? If, if I've got no way of hedging my VIX positions as a market maker with VIX itself, the only way I can hedge my VIX position is by buying S&P options and selling S&P futures. And that will replicate to some extent my VIX exposure, okay? So, so therefore, if the VIX gets a load of pressure into VIX expiry, that translates itself into S&P strength and, and it translates itself into S&P vol going down, okay? Even if it's the VIX complex that's driving the move, right? And, and that that's why it does that, right? It's a bit, I can't go into all the details here because we'll be here for two hours, but if you want to learn more about it, get in touch with us at Options Insight, but we do teach all this stuff. Yeah, and the, and, the, and the VIX and the S&P are just intrinsically linked, obviously, because of the fact that the VIX is calculated from S&P 500 options. And so, you know, there was an interesting, um, uh, I don't know if it was a lawsuit. Somebody got in trouble several years ago, right, because they were, it, it was argued that they were manipulating the settlement of VIX using S&P options. They would put in kind of like phantom S&P bids, right, and shift the VIX around. And so if you kind of Google that, you can, you can look that up. But it, it sheds light on you know, uh, on exactly how this sort of thing works and how the complex works a little bit. And so, you know, that that's what really ties, I think, everything together just from a very uh, high level, uh, high level view here. Um, and, and so, you know, Scarlett, I hope that helps. And, and Emma, thank you for, for chiming in on that one as well. Um, the other the other sort of factor here, we're looking at real time S&P uh, options deltas being traded. And this is the forty five hundred level. Um, and so, you know, tomorrow we're going to, we're going to hit expiration, right? Uh, VIX expiration at nine 30 in the morning. We've seen a couple of times where literally the high of the ESE mini futures is at nine 30 on that VIX open. And I just can't shake that. There's something to that, uh, that's going to happen this time where you get this ball compression right now and you get these big put positions at 14 expiring tomorrow on the VIX and, and that's helping to hold up equities and, 
And maybe when we clear out those positions, we get a little release. And then, you know, that allows the ball to float a little more. And a lot of these call positions are going to be set to burn, uh, burn up. Because, look, even though we're getting such a big bid to all the calls right now, as soon as those call values start to dry up, right, so many of them are now tied to Friday's expiration, that leads to, to a lot of mean reversion. Um, and so the, the chart I actually want to bring up here, you know, let's just look at NVIDIA, for example. Um, in teal is zero DTE options trading. That means Friday's expiration, right, for NVIDIA. And then in, in purple is all expiration flow. And so what you can see is that for almost the entire day up until, let's call it 10 minutes ago, 30, 20 minutes ago, it's been pure zero DTE trading in NVIDIA, right? Uh, meaning Friday's expiration is all it's trading. The CPI didn't unlock this next level of people buying, you know, next January calls because they think that everything changed, right? This is like this momentum trade uh, that that really picked up on this whole thing. And you could argue, okay, that broke apart a little bit here in the last 10 minutes. But, you know, that, that type of thing is what you see all over the place. So this reaction to CPI is, there's so much of the short dated options trading, you know, coming into play here that I think exacerbated this this move. Mm -hmm. uh, you got the volatility kind of complex crush expiration happening tomorrow morning. Like there's all these things that are kind of like lining up and 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 uh, and suggesting that the options market positioning here really has stretched the the the, the very very short term move. I think is 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 the way that I would try to frame it. So how would you how would you want to play that then? If you think there's a bit of a pullback, would you use Friday Friday puts to play it? Friday put spreads, or would you go into next week option? I think you can structure put flies in here. Is is we talked about this in the past, particularly during like the meme mania episodes, and this to me feels like a mini meme mania where you can you can you can structure in short term. Uh, you know, put flies if you see big gamma strikes uh, around expiration because so many names have such large options expirations now uh, mm -hmm. set up for uh, set up for Friday. You know, all these big stocks have their top gamma expiring now. Uh, we were looking at Tesla earlier today, for example. Tesla's at 235. And so you can see these big levels, uh, you know, lining up here. And, and th these will all refresh for tomorrow morning. And I think provide these very interesting strikes that you can try to position put flies around, for example, uh, I, I think you could also sell call spreads and all these names where you have, you know, stock up, vol up, which is a lot of the situations I think here. Um, I don't know if this would be, I don't often look at like the, is, is it, is it VIX, is it VX Apple? I don't, I don't know a whole lot about these, but this actually looks like it's down um, today. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if that's the right index, but I, I think that a lot of these, you know, to the chart we were showing before, before at the fixed strike ball, I think the the vols call vol is up, or the or higher strikes have a higher implied vol right now, which is, you know, maybe right for selling some short dated spreads, like selling next week's call spreads, for example. Uh, and a lot of these names that are up three, four, five percent, betting that this equity market, you know, consolidates just a little bit, and that sets up, you know, an opportunity for year end rally. It's also arguably a very interesting time for maybe some counter spreads where you're selling, you know, this this week's calls and then getting longer, you know, December options expiration calls. Uh, you know, I think that that is also kind of an interesting uh, setup here too. Um, one other one other things I wanted to bring up here, Imran, in in this idea of, of VIX sort of consolidating. When you look at the the general calendar coming up, and, and our calendar uh, here is only you know a week out or so, I don't think that there's any major data point really, and I think the CPI has really taken the the wheels off a lot of other future data points. I don't think that there's any real major events now until uh, 12, 13, which is FOMC. You got Thanksgiving next week. So next week, everyone's going to be asleep at the wheel. That puts us basically into, you know, late, you know, late November. And then you got really two weeks until options expiration in FOMC, FOMC on the 13th and, um, and OPEX is on the 15th. So, you know, you mentioned before that you could see VIX really sliding down to 12 and, to your point about how that links to equity market uh, and, and kind of the Vanna trade writ large, if we don't have any real events here, um, you know, vol can, can just continue to drift down over the next two weeks, accelerated by, you know, the Thanksgiving holiday and that kind of thing. And, and that's a real tailwind for these next two weeks as well, don't you think? 100%. And, and you've also got that big JP Morgan strike that's providing a load of long as well, right? So, well, there's going to be some shorts coming against that, but in general, 
that is the that is the way round the street is. So yeah, we're up here at forty five. That's that's roughly where that strike was, right? The forty five hundred area, and that's going to provide long gamma to end of December. So if the street is going to have a load of long gamma, yes, we got a big move today on a data point, but we could easily go sleepy, realize go sub ten, and that's going to drag that's going to drag the VIX down. And. and- one interesting thing that you know came up a lot earlier this year, and, and I am also curious your you know your thought on this is that you know the big story over the summer was the breakdown in 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 correlation, I guess, and and we had this AI rally, right? That any name associated with AI just went moon, right? And and everyone's pointing, oh, this correlation is making all these unique and interesting changes, and um, and it was this AI narrative, right? We're gonna Rates don't matter for the AI stocks because they're, you know, different echelon. Um, now that rates have come down so sharply, at least in the short term, you can make and, and you could argue that, hey, now Russell stocks have a better chance or a lot of the crap you know, <laughs> couldn't catch a bid uh, for for this year at least has this window now where, well, that story may be falling apart. Right. So some of these names that could could arguably start to play catch up like the IWMs. Um, mm-hmm. Does does that change the way that correlation could behave here in other words you could make an argument that you want to own mag seven that was the only thing you could own before to play you know another rally here over the next couple of weeks mm-hmm. does your view change on that with rates coming down and, and maybe rates not being this element that would lean on certain stocks and certain sectors in the same way or, or do you still want to just stay long mag seven as a way to express upside yeah it's a good question i mean you know we like we flagged in today's note for options insight we said that it looked like Annoyingly, the note went out one minute before the print, so people probably didn't get to action it. But we said IWM has underperformed by about 13% versus the Qs. And people might start to now say, okay, we want to hunt for some value into year end rather than buy the expensive stuff, right? Um, are you still there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you got hidden on the screen. <laughs> Sorry. But, but uh, so, yeah, I, it's one of those. It, it, it may well be that as rates vol. And we've had a decent amount of rates vol, but kind of if rates vol comes down a bit, then it may lend itself to a more correlated market. And therefore, if we get a year end rally, we get a bit of a broad base year end rally because people just put money to work. And they instead of need instead of feeling the need to rotate from one one part of the market into another, you might just get broad based kind of passive inflows that just come into everything. Right. So. I don't know. You probably need rates vol to calm down um, and it's got some room still to come down. But if it does, then uh, then, yeah, I think you could get a more correlated rally. Yeah, it's it, it, it's uh, it, it's really an interesting thought dynamic now, as you mentioned, with the JP Morgan collar and, and these big positions in the S&P. Uh, you know, I, I don't have a reason to adjust my target on the S&P. This, you know, let's call it 4550 now. I'll just give myself a little bit of grace on an upside strike. I think the JP Morgan collar is at 45, you know, 10. Um, and, you know, I'll feel a lot better about that if we get kind of consolidation here. Techno asks about 4460, which is the spider call wall from yesterday. Um, you know, that, that's that got to be seen as like a support area, I think, at the, at, the, at this time. So, like, if we pull back over the next couple of areas down to 4,500, then we have, you know, a final rally in the year end. Uh, but I think, you know, the S&P could get sort of jammed up into that into that neighborhood still. And so, you know, I would rather own IWMs, Mag Sevens, and some of these other names as a way to, uh, mm. you know, kind of outperform. Um, yeah, to the that's, that's true. That's true. It may be that that supply, that supply of S and P vol, just kind of keeps the S and P a little bit more anchored, and then the other stuff around it can kind of move. Right. I mean, I'm interested to know if the energy sector is going to bounce. I mean, look, this is just <laughs> this is crazy. Sorry okay. to interrupt you, but look at this. Is this is uh, Microsoft, and uh, I mean, it's just you know, it's it's amazing. Um, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> how far back is that chart gone? Well, that, that goes back to 1987, <laughs> and I got to do the log scale and all that other stuff. But it's it's just, uh, I mean, it's just it's remarkable, right? Um, on the, on the idea of we, we have a couple of questions on the Bank of Japan. I don't know if you have any expertise in there. The dollar's obviously moving down, so a couple of people have commented on here. And you also mentioned oil. So if you want to wax politically in a couple of those uh, so what's uh, kind the of macro on, indicators. What's the question on Bank of Japan? Uh, there's a little bit of back and forth here about 
uh, BOJ as a possible intervention? Was that discussed already? Um, yeah, you know, no, that, that wasn't discussed. Yeah, I mean, they, they there have been some spikes lower in in um, in dollar yen recently. Like I think yesterday or the day before. But now, I mean, it's a broad based dollar move as well, right? So the dollar got whacked. So that kind of helped dollar yen come down as well. Obviously, dollar yen is not down as much as euros up, cables up. Aussie dollar, they're all up like nearly 2%, whereas dollar yen's only down, you know, half that. So I don't, that, that, that's not an intervention. I don't think that's an intervention move. Like when it gets up at 152, it looks like they don't like it. And maybe they, I don't know if they've actually intervened or it's just their words are strong enough, but some of the price action looks a bit fishy, like they might have intervened up at 152. But today's move is, is more of a broad dollar move, I'd say. Hmm. Uh, thank you for some insights there. I have literally nothing to offer on that subject, so <laughs> we'll move on a little bit. Uh, David Evans asked here about uh, if you want to structure some weakness. I, I, you know, when I've seen the weakness, I see it literally happen like at 930 on VIX expiration day. So I don't know that I would necessarily, you know, depending on how you want to put your position on. I mean, we're so stretched today, right? Um, should there be a reason for, for the equity market to give any kind of weakness today? Uh, maybe not, I'm not confident about what will happen overnight. Um, but you know, I think whether you put a put spread on today or sell some call spreads, I might be more inclined to sell call spreads here, I think. Um, and then look to buy maybe a put or some put spreads, uh, tomorrow, you know, as the market opens. Uh, but again, you know, I think it, my concern is that it, that's being too cute, right? If you think there's going to be some consolidation here, then, um, maybe sell some calls and buy some puts uh, in the S&P for that. Again, I think it's short-term consolidation. Uh, I do particularly, as a lot of people are talking about NVIDIA and the like. And with NVIDIA, it's challenging because of earnings are, are next week. So I don't know that I want to do, trade any counter spreads there. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's plenty of other names, you know, Microsoft, Apple, et cetera, that are up a lot where you don't have to worry about earnings. And I think the the counter spreads, you know, selling something like very short dated calls here to buy the November, uh, Decembers, I think can be uh, really quite interesting because the idea is that, implied vol is up in those names you know stock up vol up and i think those are interesting times to sell some of these uh uh call up uh call spreads um yeah lauren asked about a whole vix complex uh we don't have a uh, we don't have a ticker that monitors a whole vix call spread um you know the 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 other interesting dynamic i think to play the the equity market rally here I, I think because there's the opportunity for a pretty significant rally this trade is maybe not as interesting uh but obviously shorting these vix call uh, these you know the vix complex for at large has been it's always does very well um and you know the vix levels into to 12 i think after this options expiration if all those pop at all these, these will be interesting trades to kind of set it and forget it so there's another way kind of to express the santa rally there um that's for lauren Douglas asked about ARC, and I haven't looked at an ARC chart. Have you seen ARC yet, Imran? I mean, I think it's exploded higher today. Don't cheat. What do you think it's up? Yeah, I mean, it has been. It's been doing okay, right? It had. Oh, it had a pretty not strong as much rally. as I thought, actually. Five no, percent. No, no, but it had off the low. I mean, it was brutal, right? It went from thirty-five to forty in a heartbeat. Right? Yeah. So it's been consolidating a bit. Um, I mean, it's one of those. If we get a year-end rally, yeah, it could push. Could push back up to 45 um that's that's quite a big that's like the shoulder i don't really look at head and shoulders normally but it does look like a clear shoulder area um, yeah. so um i don't have a strong opinion on arc i mean it's got a bit of crypto correlation to it as well and i'm, I'm net net still still at the margin bullish on crypto so i guess that probably makes me a, a bit bullish on arc and if you think rates have topped I mean, I, I was looking for bonds to have a bit more of a meaningful rally than the, than, than the last few times we had dead cat bounces. So if you think the bond rally's got some legs, it looks like rates have topped. We've got some inflation data now to support that view. We've got crypto rallying as well. All those things in general are pretty supportive for ARC. Um, yeah, I, uh, hard, it's, it's hard to disagree with you on that one. I think ARC 50... Uh, you know, seems like maybe we got a little bit of room to run there on ARC 50. I, one of the interesting things is that, which just kind of crossed my mind, is is uh, I think we made a meme like joking about this before where, you know, everybody was in these money market funds and everybody's loving, you know, 
uh, risk free. And that seems very sexy <laughs> until IWMs are up 5% in a day, right? And so, you know, do we also have the situation where suddenly everyone goes like, oh, this 5% isn't so great anymore. You know, let me get my year end rally. And there is this sort of catch up rush. I mean, um, it depends what sort of investor you are, right? Like, clearly, there's there's more volatility. Well, everybody only trades zero DTEs, Imran. I don't know if you've uh, taken the temperature <laughs> yeah, yeah. of the room anymore. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. To your, to your point, it depends on it depends on your time frames and stuff. So, so your time frame and, and like what volatility you're willing to stomach, right? Like, it can go up five percent a day, but that means it can go down five percent a day as well, right? So, it, it's a it's a theory. it's a great point. Um, you know, of course, uh, in theory. But but these you know I, I don't know they're head, head, heads and shoulders all over the place that we're seeing here. Um, so it would be an interesting contest to 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 uh, show here. Maybe we should give away some uh, options inside propaganda around um, you know t-shirts and like around you know what is what is up the most from Thanksgiving into year end. Um, Someone's asking if I've still short Madon. So I think that question is based on our strategy compass. So. The, the model, the mod, if you've been watching that strategy compass that we do on single stocks, right, that is a daily model that we run, right? And the idea is to identify things that look stretched either from a vol or spot or both perspective and to just give you what the, the, the simplest possible one-legged trade would be to express that view, right? But I don't really have a fundamental view in any of those stocks. None, none of that analysis is really based on a fundamental view on those stocks. So the way I pick and choose those ideas is based on the stats on where the vol is and where the spot is in its range. Okay. And the idea that if we are in a mean reversion dynamic, then this is the trade that makes sense. But in terms of executing, like I don't even execute most of those trades. I execute some, some versions of some of them. And I often do them as spreads because I'm, I don't like, I don't run it. I don't like running naked, especially when I sell options. I sell options that don't run naked short risk in single stocks. I think that's a recipe for disaster. And then on the long side, I need to have a pretty high conviction about owning a single stock trade. I've got to have a view on that, right? So for me, this is to help guide you guys to see what stuff is stretched. And then if that lines up with your fundamental view on the stock or your short-term tactical view on the stock, and you, you have, you're looking at some technicals as well, and, and it lines up, then, then it makes sense, right? But I, I don't... I don't sit with these views for long periods of time. They're more just to try and identify tactical opportunities that might work over the course of a few days to a week. And then you would actually monetize and unwind them or you would cut them if they didn't work. Right. That's that's how you should think about the single stock ideas. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I, I agree with you. I think that's one of the interesting things about the, the options landscape is that, uh, you show up when when vols are are, are skewed <laughs> or or shifted in, in unique ways, uh, and you don't take a lot of fundamental um, positions necessarily. You know, we, we don't trade the options always based on the fundamentals. Um, but you know, if you're going to get a collapse in interest rates and a, a broad market rally where all stocks are up five percent, well, it's going to be odds on that whatever put position you have on is probably losing money, right? Um, you know, this is this is when the macro just sort of washes over uh, whatever kind of single stock positions you may have, um, and 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 it is a pretty nicely interesting from you know right right in this October opex time frame. This this really seemed to rally uh, pretty strongly. Um, so to to that point there, um, David asks again, how does the VIX expiry occur at the market open? Uh, the, the VIX index just settles at, at the, at 9.30 tomorrow morning. So that's how, that's how that expiration works. Um, and then some questions on Roku and Roblox. I mean, you know, everything is just up in unison. And so I think, uh, I do think that a lot of people are going to be looking for, for names to try to trap and squeeze here. Uh, this seems like a nice moment for Wall Street bets to sort of reemerge and and try to get this one a last final rally help fuel, help fuel the end of year rally yeah um one one topic that's come up for me a couple of times recently uh we talked about this yesterday in this new podcast we started doing called the opex effect um this is the and i and i'd love to get your kind of a, a opinion on this obviously and this this was from yesterday pre-cpi which is a whole different event uh markets are a whole whole different animal now 
uh, a lot of people have been up on this idea of the link between rates. So you got the U.S. 10 years, the red green candle, and this is versus the VIX. And you could see the correlation. And, you know, we, we've made jokes recently about how, uh, you know, everybody this year has been a, a rate trader, you know, uh, in disguise, right? Because your view on equities had to be so tied to rates. And I was watching CPIs and now we're watching treasury auctions and all these other kinds of things. And so what was interesting is that with the bad jobs report at the end of October, and then Powell came out and kind of took a nothing done on the FOMC. Uh, th this is the 10 year again, but rates in general have, have come off their highs and they've held and now they're down a lot. Right. And so equity vol has, has seemingly broken its link from the rates trade. And I think as long as rates stay at or below where they are, then equity vol is not, not really going to pay attention anymore. Obviously, if, if 10 year goes back to 5% or whatever, then, okay, great, equity vol is going to come in. And so what, what, the, what I think is interesting at this point is that, okay, we got two, three weeks of you know, nothing going on. You know, and then you start to talk about year end flows and what's going to happen in 2024. Um, our, the meme we sort of made, which I think kind of encompasses this, and, I, and I'd love to get your opinion on this, is that, you know, do we shift from everyone caring about just about rates to now we run into this con worry or concern where if we continue to get bad data for whatever the reason may be, then traders have to start pricing in, okay, a recession is actually coming and we need to sell stocks because the economy is going down as opposed to caring about the you know, the, the, the impact of rates, right? Cause everything's been inversely correlated. Now bad data means market goes up. Uh, bad economic data means market goes up. Good economic data means the market goes down. Are we set to sort of like shift all that thing back in correlation now? Is that going to be kind of a theme that we start to look at here into 2024? I, I doubt it. I, I think today's move telegraphs that the dynamic of rate cuts equals equity strength right like i don't you know there's no sign of it yet right so the more the more recessionary signals we get the more the rates market will price cuts the sooner the cuts will be priced into the curve and the more the equity market will be good will be good with it basically right i i genuinely don't see how that's changed like today today kind of clearly shows that dynamic right but is the but I believe, and, and if anyone has a, a link to this chart and link to this data, I believe that the equity market tends to sell off at the first cut, I believe is is what the data historically has uh, to that, that, Yeah, but I'm talking about cuts being priced, not cuts being delivered, right? So I'm saying as, as long as cuts are priced into the rates curve, I think the equity market will like that, right? Now, what actually happens when they actually cut, I don't know. Because often what happens is, they only actually they say no 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 to the rates market saying yes 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 for cuts and then they suddenly throw in the towel and go yeah it's a shit show we know we're going to cut now right <laughs> and and that shit show suddenly becomes apparent in a matter of two weeks because something like covid happens or whatever it is right but so i think that's kind of how it works i think the equity market cheers the idea that rate cuts are coming rate cuts are, rate cuts are coming but they don't actually come until the equity market has a bit of a wobble for whatever reason, and then they come, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So the, then the idea that uh, if the data continues to sort of deteriorate, then then we have more signs that we're entering a recessionary environment. That in and of itself is not going to be not, not necessarily going to matter for stocks. If anything, you still think that will be a, a, a supportive of stocks, I guess. I think so. And the reason I say that is like the price action we're seeing today, right? It's a big, big repricing of 20 bips in the rates curve in like late next mm -hmm. year onwards. And well, I mean, it's the biggest update we've had in ages. Yeah. Uh, very um, interesting insights from you there, Imran. Interesting non-options insights. Uh, two more quick uh, single stock uh, mentions here. In Target you know, this one's been beat up for forever. You talk about the names that are set to rally. It's got earnings tomorrow. So uh, we talked about this on Monday that we, I I thought puts res were interesting here because of the fact that uh, it seemed like at, it was at a local low. I mean, this thing, it's got a chart that makes it look like a good rip, but if earnings are a disaster, who knows? So I, I still think that trade is interesting. And then the other one that you know, we were talking about uh, of the pig stocks was Disney. Uh, it reported earnings already. And, and I think it, 
you know, I had a lot of positioning that supported up to 100. So I saw those names just come across the chat. Um, and again, Imran and I have been trying to, to cover some of these single stock interesting trades uh, on Monday. So uh, please um, check out those shows. Uh, now, Imran, as we kind of approach the top of the hour here, one of the things that you and I uh, focus on uh, are some interesting options, questions that people may have. So if you want to talk about setting up certain trade structures or different kind of educational based topics here, uh, one of the things that you and I do together is we have the Options uh, Spot Game Academy, which teaches you everything from what an option is all the way on up to portfolio hedging and the like. In fact, if you scan the QR code at the top of your screen, I always forget that's the left or the right, you see the hedge there. Uh, but you can go to academy.spotgamma.com and check out that course. Uh, so we'd like to take some questions here about specifically, uh, you know, how maybe you want to structure trades or different things that are kind of academy or education related. So I will check the chat for that. But if any of you have any other questions, I know there was a bunch of questions around how the VIX, you know, linked to the S&P 500. Um, in this case, you know, if you have any interesting trade ideas, I'll just scroll through quickly and see if we have anything there. Got any topics that come to top of mind there, Imran, here uh, that could be good educational insights? Uh, um, what, actually, um, here's kind of an interesting one. PNS about, and I think this is a this is a good, interesting uh, topic here that you and I can, can touch on. We have a dual situation here where we mentioned the J.P. Morgan collar trade, which is at 4510, I believe. And mm -hmm. that's, of course, a short call position from, from the fund. Dealers are long that call. We all know that story. But the other interesting dynamic here is the, J, is the JEPI QYLD. Uh, and if you go to a spot, if you Google spot gamma JEPI, you'll get a whole breakdown of what this means. But that's a $30 billion fund. And they sell S&P calls uh, against a basket of value stocks. And so the idea here is that on a one, they, they sell typically one month calls. Um, and every week they're selling one month calls, right? A, a tranche of them. So that's actually the same portfolio manager. Uh, Hamilton, his last name is, is escaping me. I apologize uh, if he's watching. I doubt he is, but if you are, I apologize for uh, <laughs> missing a last name. Uh, but at any rate, there's, there's this call supply that that single individual is, you know, to the tunes of, of billions of dollars. Um, if this... If this call overriding, if these call overriding schemes continue to sort of increase, right? And 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 Jeppy's an interesting one because, you know, I, I think it's underperformed the market writ large, but it has a big fat dividend which draws a lot of people into it. Um, as you can see here, it's, it, you know, it, it's indicated yields down nine percent, uh, but this obviously, it, this uh, on a total return basis, you know, trails the S and P five hundred itself. What do you think or how big do you think the supply or how do you think about this as these call overriding kind of funds increase as as these big, you know, entities start to sell calls? Does that slow down the upside volatility of the S&P? Does that kind of vol supply or gamma supply slow down the upside movement of the S&P or, or, or is it a non-event or kind of how do you think about that? No, I think it definitely has an impact, right? Because there's, there's just that that trade has so many forms you know, whether it's naked call selling, not naked, but call selling against longs, whether it's uh, short dated variant selling, there, there is constant supply of gamma hitting the street, right? And that does have an impact. That's why that's why implied correlation trades on the 20 handle now, right? Because you've had this world where there's loads of natural supply of index vol, but there isn't as much supply of single stock vol. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, people actually want to buy single stock options because they want to play Play the stories and they want to own tech stocks or own tech exposure and stuff like that so i think it has a huge impact um but there will be days where it's not enough to hold the market because the 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 other flows that are non-options related are just bigger right um and today's a good good example of that yeah and and um what's interesting about the way that this fund in particular works is that they they like to sell the index calls because they're cash settled and they own, you know, stocks that they're going to outperform and, and they don't overwrite dollar for dollar, but the idea is that they, they don't want to give up their holdings. Right. So that's why they don't overwrite, you know, if they own cat, for example, they don't sell cat calls because they don't want to have their stock, you know, called away. They, they want to own those positions. And, and I think that the more these funds grow, you know, it, it could impact correlation, I think is, is one of the more interesting ways where, you know, look, you got this, the supply of calls overhead that should be maybe making things sticky as we move up in the S and P. Uh, but on the single stock side, you know, you can continue to move higher. 
Um, and that, that also leads us, you know, lastly here as we round up the conversation into JEPY, which is the, a hilarious ticker choice um, because JEPY is the fund that sells the zero DTE puts. And the performance of this fund here, I think, over the last couple of weeks highlights why it is just not a great investment because you get slammed with the naked puts. And then when the market rallies, you don't participate in that rally at all, right? Um, no, you just earn a tiny little slither of premium. You get your right? 20, 25 bits back. So you you lost, you know, three to 5% on a few days, probably uh, or over a few days last week. And now you need 10, 15 <laughs> days of uh, being correct and and uh, fully capturing your put premium in order to benefit, uh, you know, at the market rally. So, um, you know, selling the zero DD puts is a, is a different animal from selling those uh, those those upside calls. And, and JEPI is a, is a completely different beast at $30 billion AUM versus JPY, which I don't know how much money is assigned to that thing, but uh, <laughs> probably not. Are you, are, you try, are you trying to share charts because we can't see any charts? Oh, you know what? So, you should have uh, mentioned that before this whole time we were talking. Here's the JEPY <laughs> chart. <laughs> Uh, as you can see here, you know, it, it, it's inception was recent and, and as the market's gone down, it, cause it sells naked puts gets crushed and then yeah. it continues to sell as naked puts on day like today. And it makes, I think their target is 25 basis points a day is what they're trying to make. Um, so you yeah. need a, a large string. So how, much, days. how much is it? How much is it down since inception? It's like 10%. I mean, this is, this is brutal, right? Um, it's 10 percent down right yeah yeah and it, it can't you know it can't recover uh it can't recover very quickly wow. at all and and now kind of like owning tlt right now you're feeling real bad about it because you know the iwms are even up uh this is the jeppy fund uh apologies for everybody uh, not being on my my game there uh but this is underperforming s p writ large with the but it does have a pretty healthy dividend which a lot of the retirees out there like mm -hmm. and i and i do think if we end up in a situation where we just you know, obviously we just trade more or less sideways, you know, uh, then, then this could outperform, I think, um, in some ways. So this is a buy, this is a buy, right? This, this is a buy, right? right. Yeah. And they own value right. stocks and, and, uh, and then sell it, you know, the tranche of the weekly calls. So, um, Oh, so they own value stocks, but then they sell S and P calls against. Cor them. Correct, right? So they own—I don't know what stocks they own, but let's say they own, you know, Caterpillar and Nvidia because that's a value stock, and you know, whatever Coca-Cola, <laughs> uh, and then sell SPX index calls against it. Um, so it, it's an interesting. If you listen to the recording that they gave, uh, again, if you Google Spot Gamma Jeppy, um, and I think Hamilton, uh, you'll come up with our link. And, and we have the recording that he made with, with some of our notes. And it's, it's very interesting. I, I was very like, anti uh, this methodology and, and and came around to it. I liked it a little bit better after listening to, to the, the breakdown of the strategy. Uh, but it's hard to deny that, you know, I think on a lot of times on a total return basis, these call overwriting schemes tend to underperform. Uh, but maybe you want the yield because you're, you know, that's how you structure your portfolio. Or maybe there's some other kind of reasons that you like it, like the, in theory, lower equity volatility or something, but uh, worth a little bit of, of study there. Um, yeah, so uh, Imran, I think we will round it out there as we're approaching the top of the hour. Do you want to give kind of one or two more quick, you know, one quick view on how you see things? I know you are two on the equity market rally bandwagon here. So given gun to head, yeah, you I, I was, I've been banging on about a year end rally for a while. Um, we did manage to get long. We thought this week was going to be a pause. We got that wrong. So we sold some gamma. So we're kind of licking our wounds a little bit from being short gamma on some iron condors, but we got stopped out of those today. Um, I, I do sympathize with your view that we may get a, a very near term pullback somewhere between tomorrow and early next week. Um, if you get that pullback, close your eyes and buy the rally for your end. Right, that's what I think. Right, so I don't personally feel like I need to chase that pullback. Yeah. I'd rather just wait for that pullback and then buy that. That pullback coming will give me a chance to buy the market, so it'll feel like I've made money, even if I haven't got a position. Right, I, so I'd rather just sort of do it that way rather than try and short this market yeah. when there's so many flows against that. Uh, I think that's a bit dangerous. So I, I'd lean short vol. I systematically would lean short vol. I think the VIX hits a 12 handle. But in terms of actual equity delta, I would be a buyer of dips. 
uh, you and I pretty much line up, and I, and I think that I generally have a hard time buying stocks when they're up five, six percent, uh, like a lot of them are today. And so, even if you don't necessarily want to short uh, here, I think that some consolidation. I, I do believe consolidation is due this next week. I too would be looking to buy that. Um, I, I think it's also you know it can be dangerous buying a stock that's up five, six percent because it can give two and a half, three percent back uh, in very short order, and you know. So, so you could sort of be chasing, I think, right now is, a, is the ultimate risk. Um, and I, I think, you know, I really like this idea of selling uh, call spread calendars. So selling no uh, options expiration to buy, you know, decent expiration and a lot of these stocks that are up quite a bit. Um, and I, I think still you want to own the winners, right? I think Microsoft and stuff are the safest bets to, to continue to outperform as opposed to maybe buying the arcs where you could get a rally. But, you know, look, the winners, there's no reason for those things to stop at this point. Um, so we will, uh, so we look for that. And I also think if we do get any kind of a VIX pop, you know, being short, those volatility trade, the VXXs of the world that works very well for a whole lot of reasons we talked about before. And that should be another trade. I think that works well over the last two, three weeks, um, or the next two, three weeks as well. So, um, that is how we're looking at it. Uh, Imran, how can people get a hold of you to see all of your excellent content and, uh, reach you on Twitter? Sure. Uh, so it's uh, options underscore insight on Twitter or X as, as it's now called and um, options hyphen insight.com is our website where you can delve deeper into all the stuff we produce. We've got daily research, we, daily macro ideas, uh, weekly macro research with my portfolio of options that I'm running. So you can see how, how I kind of structure those trades and how I think about them. And then we've got crypto weekly as well for any of you who are in the crypto space which is pretty hot right now, actually. Yeah. And and like I said before, that Coinbase, MSTR, those all showed up on our squeeze scanners. And we talked about that in yesterday's Monday call. Uh, please join us every Monday. We've been doing these Monday morning meetings, which focuses a little bit on some of our single stock ideas. Uh, and so uh, we will look forward to seeing you then. Uh, Imran, as always, thank you very much. You can reach us at Spot Gamma uh, on Twitter or X. And uh, also check us out at SpotGamma.com. We're getting a free seven-day trial of our daily notes and all of our data tools. And so with that, Imran, buddy, I will see you on Monday.